God and not what they don't have. It is that is between them and God. But this, what you receive from God, needs to be your focus. He begins to talk about Jesus and he begins to talk about where Christ came from. And he says, Jesus came from above. We are from the earth. That Jesus is greater than any human. That Jesus is greater and we need to understand that he testifies about the things that he saw and has seen and that he has heard. And when you begin to put your trust in Christ, you begin to take his word, you begin to take the stories of what he told and you begin to take them as, as an understanding that he was literally sent from God to bring into creation a manifestation, a display, if you will, of the heart of God for humanity and of the will of God for humanity. Jesus came and he became the giant magnifying glass for our lives. See, the scriptures had been given, the prophecies had been told, and yet there remained still so many questions and so much blurriness to our relationship with God. Men would read the prophets and they would think, oh, I know what God has for me, and yet they could not understand that God literally had a heart like a father for them. They feared God and they wanted to serve God, but they didn't understand the, the, the way that they needed to understand God's intention towards their life. And God sent Christ and said, Jesus is going to be the big magnifying glass that is going to make things crystal clear for you to understand that God loves you and that God wants to be in a relationship with you. That your sin is a big deal and it will kill you. But Jesus came to make a way for your sin to be dealt with so that you can be close to God. Amen. And as Christ comes into this story, John begins to say story after story after story. He says, Jesus displays to us the Spirit without limitation. See, up until that time, the Holy Spirit had been present in creation, but He had been present in limited doses, in limited situations. God's Spirit would come on a man, and He would give him the ability to do a miracle or to do something empowered by God's Spirit, where God would speak to a man, a prophet, and it would come in glimpses, it would come in spurts. But, but John says, when you look at Jesus... He has the Spirit without limitation. All the time, 24-7, walking in the Spirit of God, hearing the heart of God, the, the voice of God, and being obedient to bring into, real, into creation the display of what God wants it to look like. John said, Jesus has this. And then he says this, he says, the Father has put everything into His hands. The Father loves the Son and has put everything into His hands. And anyone who believes in God's Son will have eternal life. John understands his role in this story. He understands that he is not the Messiah, that he is not the big deal. He understands that he has come to prepare a way for Jesus. And he uses this analogy. He says, I'm like the guy at the wedding who's the best man. He's like, I'm not the one getting married. I'm not the one that all of the focus is on. He says, but I'm standing right next to him. I'm listening to his vows. I'm supporting him. And I am happy and joyful at his success. He says, this is my role, is to lift up what Jesus is doing. And for me to understand his role, and for me to understand my role says something really powerful. He says, Jesus must become greater and I must become less. He must become greater and I must become less. You know, this is a this is an amazing statement that, that John makes in this in this story about his view of Jesus and about his view of himself. But I want you to understand something tonight. And I don't want you to be confused about it in any way, shape, or form. Because whether you realize it or not, you and I are also represented in this story. You and I could put ourselves in this story tonight. And I ask you, which character would you pick? If you think you're in this story. 
Many of us tonight would say, it's all about Jesus. We're John the Baptist. And we would say, he must become greater and I must become less. And from one standpoint, you would be right because we would all agree that humility is the currency of the kingdom of God. Only with humility can you understand the depths, the mysteries, and the true wealth that is available in the kingdom of God. And John was demonstrating humility. But on one sense, you would be wrong. Because what Jesus wants for you to see in this story, and what Jesus wants for us to understand, is that everything Jesus did in his life was a demonstration and was a model and an example for you and I to follow. Jesus told this parable in Matthew chapter 9. He was asked a question one day. He says, why don't your Pharisees or your disciples fast like we do and like the Pharisees do? And Jesus replied to them and he said, do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. Jesus is talking about himself. He says, but someday the groom will be taken away from them and then it will be time to fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. Jesus said, no one dares to put new wine into old wineskins. For the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. No, he says, new wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. I want you to understand something about what we read in this, in this story with John. John makes some statements about Jesus. He says, Jesus has the spirit without limitation. Jesus walks in such a way with God that when God speaks, he hears him. That Jesus has a connection with God that is so intimate and is so close that when God says Jesus moved, Jesus moves. When God says Jesus speak, Jesus speaks. John's telling a story now saying to you, who are you in this story, my friends? God wants you to recognize that you are to take up the role that Jesus was walking out in this world. That you are to be the one to take up the role and to begin to demonstrate the love of God to this world. That you can also say, my Father loves me and everything that is His has been put in my hands. God has given Himself to me without limitation and He has poured out in my life everything that He has. And Jesus tells this story, He says, how foolish would it be to have a wedding celebration with the groom? And for all of the guests to be mourning or in a time of sadness. He says, no. He's like, when it's celebration time, it's time to celebrate. And he says, I'm here on this earth for a short period of time. And while I'm here, my followers are going to celebrate my coming. The time will come when it will be time to get down to work. And it will be time to fast. And there will be much kingdom business to take care of. And there is much prayer to pray. And there is time to abstain from food. And there is time to do spiritual warfare. But Jesus says, right now, I'm here. It's not time for that. But then he follows it up and he says, besides that, besides that, he says, I am in the process of doing something that has never been done before. And he uses this example of a cloth. Now, things have changed in our culture, so we don't, we don't deal with, with cloth and clothing and sewing quite nearly as much our clothes are thrown away and go to the store and pick up another one or whatever. But there was a time when if you had a hole in a garment and the, and the, and the, the threads had been worn and they had already shrunk and they had already been stretched to their limit and you have this hole, you don't throw your garment away because it's got a hole in it, you patch it. But he says this concept that you would take a brand new patch that has never been shrunk, that has never been stretched, that has never gone through the process before, and you would patch an old garment with a brand new patch, he says, it's only going to take a little bit 
And that patch is going to tear and destroy the garment even more. He says the same thing is true with, with making wine. They would use animal skins and they would pour grape juice that hadn't fermented yet into this, into this fresh skin. And as it would ferment, it would stretch, it would expand, and the skin would grow. And he said, you can't take that skin that's already been stretched to its limits and pour brand new juice in it again and let it do it again. It'll burst and you'll lose all of the fluid. Jesus is talking about the timeline and the story of God when he says, I am getting ready to pour out a brand new spirit. I am getting ready to pour myself out into new skins, into new vessels that will carry it, into new things. He says, the old has been stretched to its limit and it cannot contain the new outpouring of the spirit that it's going to come. He says, I need something brand new that I can pour into that is going to accommodate what I'm about to do through. Amen. And Jesus was talking about us. Jesus was talking about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as I heard today at Donnie Moore's service, took ordinary college students back in the early 80s and began to turn their lives upside down. It started off with five students gathering together and praying for their college campus. And then it became 27 students gathering together, staying up till the, the early hours of the morning, crying out, God, would you move on the University of Pacific? Would you pour out your spirit on our campus? And all of a sudden, they tell the story of God beginning to meet them in Morris Chapel, where God began to pour out His Spirit in a way that began to take these ordinary students and began to fill them with an extraordinary outpouring of His Spirit. And their lives began to expand, and they began to go out, and they began to tell people about what God was doing. And it ushered in an incredible move of God that transformed so many people's lives, so many stories, so many ministries were birthed out of what God did in that scenario, in that scene. I'm here to tell you tonight that as we read through the Gospel of John, as we see the word believe over a hundred times written in John's Gospel, believe, 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 believe. For us to come to a place tonight to where we begin to recognize that God is calling His people to believe deeply, to believe radically, to believe in things that maybe we have not believed before. I am asking you and I am telling you that He is not asking you for some abstract thing that, oh, I, I believe in Jesus. No, He's asking you to believe in such a way that you literally say, God, I want to be the new wineskin. I want you to fill me to such a way that I begin to experience the expansion of your spirit in my life, that I begin to go out, that I begin to do things that I never believed I could possibly do. See, here's the thing. God wants your family to know Him. God wants your neighborhood to know Him. God wants your co-workers to know Him. God wants for your entire world where you have influence to be affected by the outpouring of Him in your life. And he says, will you believe that Jesus says, I make all things new? Do you believe in Christ says, I did not come just to fix you up, but I came to transform your life, to make you new, to make all things new, including me? My friends, it's so easy for us to come to a place to where we begin to feel like things are okay in my life and I'm, and I'm starting to feel like, you know, I'm good. I'm good right here. I'm just going to stay right here for a minute. And all of a sudden, the urgency that I once had felt begins to turn slowly into complacency. Mm -hmm. And I begin to feel like, you know, like, I just, I'm just going to stay right here for a while. I'm here to tell you that God knows how to remedy our complacency. He knows how to come and shake our world up. Why? Because He wants you to move. He will keep you moving. But here's the flip. Here's the flip. There's two different types of people. And I've been
in both of them, so I can tell you what they are. First one is, I'm going to move until I just decide I don't want to move anymore. And I'm going to sit, and then I'm done, and I'm just going to sit here for a while. And then there's the other person who says, God, I'm going to move until you tell me to stop. I'm going to keep on moving even when I don't feel like it. God, even when I'm so exhausted and I'm so discouraged and I feel like every time I try to take a step, it's so heavy and so hard. God, you tell me to keep moving, so I'm going to keep on moving. When I've been in the situation in my life where I stop and I go, I'm not doing this anymore. Peace, time out, I'm not going any further, God. No more movement. You would think that God would come with a heavy hand. He said, Jason, get up. It's time to move. Let's go. But I'm here to tell you from experience that what I've experienced is the opposite. Yeah. I've experienced the gentle hand of God. Where God comes to me and he says, why did you stop moving? God, I stopped moving because this person said this. This person did that. I feel like it's not working. I feel like quitting. I'm tired. I just want to do other things. I still want to do what you want me to do right now. And time after time after time after time, I experience the gentle hand of God come into my situation and say, I understand. Let me show you where you're at. It's not what I have for you. There's more for you. Let me pick you up. Let me give you the strength that you need. Let me fill you once again with what you don't have in and of yourself. Here, let me pour that new wine into you once again. And in an instant, my perspective changes. My courage comes back. My motivation is here again. And I begin to set my sights again on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. And I say, Jesus, where do you want me to go next? And when we begin to follow after him, and we begin to understand that everything in our life comes from this epiphany, this understanding that God makes all things become new, that God makes our old become brand new, that God makes our life transform into newness, that that newness never stops being new. Think about this for a second. There's this crazy story of how God walked with his people, the children of Israel, through the wilderness and through the season. And there's this little verse that talks about how God would provide for them. It talks about how their shoes never wore out on their feet. No matter what they were going through, they were walking with new all the time on their feet. Everywhere they went, God's provision was with them. I'm here to tell you that when you search the scriptures, you find promises that say things like, God, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. When I wake up, today is a brand new day to experience the brand new of what God has for my life. This is the hope of Jesus. This is the hope that we find when we begin to realize that in a world that is old, every moment and every day, God wants to give you brand new once again. What is it tonight that you have stopped believing that God could make new in your life? What is it in your life that you have stopped believing that God could make new? Is it your marriage? Have you, have you just said, you know what? I'm done. I'm out. I'm not going to try anymore. Is it, is it your situation in life with, your, with where you live and with, with all the things that you have going on and you're just like, my situations will never change. I am going to stop believing that it could possibly happen. Have you stopped believing for your children that don't know God, that aren't walking with God? Say, God, you know what? I'm done. I'm not praying anymore. I can't do it anymore. I'm out. I just don't have any more gas in the tank to keep on going through this heartbreak. What are you in your life right now saying, God, I just need to believe that you can make this new again. Some of us look at our, our life and our struggles. We look at sin in our life, the temptation in our life, and we go, God, I just can't ever get free. And we succumb to it. 
And I believe with all my heart that God wants for you tonight to hear these words. That He has more for you. He does not want you to give in to your sin and into your addiction and think that this is all there is. God wants for you as His son and as His daughter to someday look with your head held high and say, I have been set free. The son has set free. that need to be touched on tonight. We're going to ask God to put His finger on some things that, that need for us to become aware of where we are and of where God wants for us to go. I believe tonight that there is freedom for every person within the sound of my voice for you to come to a place to where you see and you experience for yourself, People. that every promise, that every scripture is for you. Right. It's not for somebody else. It's for you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. I believe it.
Jesus, thank you, God. Do it again. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. 